Day 661 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 346,000 military personnel losses, which represents an additional 1,250 in the last 24-hour reporting period. Then as for hard Hardware losses, 19 tanks, 25 APVs, and a truly whopping 37 artillery. And do note, plenty of drones on the list here, but only one missile. But that's not because Ukrainian air defenses have gotten worse when it comes to Russian missiles and neutralizing them. Quite the contrary. As instead, specifically, Russia's missile campaign of terror has notably waned. Because after Russia's large-scale firing of them, uh, off into Ukraine at, at such high rates for a non-stop period of about 12 months, of which the first uh, three months were the most missile-hungry months, it led to their inventory stocks simply becoming quite depleted. And do note, it was also presumed that Russia has been saving some missile stocks for this winter time, which I don't doubt, but we're talking vastly smaller volumes saved for use in comparison to what Russia had available last year. As an example, almost exactly on this day last year, Russia fired 76 missiles into Ukraine in a single salvo. Meanwhile, these days, Russia would be lucky to fire off half that amount of the slower and less effective Shahed drones that they've largely outsourced from Iran. So as a country, you should never blow over a decade's worth of missile inventory in just the space of 12 months without being absolutely sure that it will guarantee your strategic offensive goals. And even if it somehow does, you've just lost your inventory that allows for a, a decent defensive capability for near to midterm future unrelated conflicts. Then we'll head across to the map today and start out in Russia as a number of objects in the Russian Aerodome location of Morozovsk in the Rostov Oblast were attacked by as many as 35 Ukrainian drone UAVs last night. Now, the military airfield in Morozovsk is home to various Su-24s and Su-34s that are used in attacks on Ukraine. And so here you can see some early photos of the aftermath on at least one Russian Su-34 jet plane and with, with the damage from the debris that you can see there. And interestingly, for the Su-34 being one of Russia's supposedly most elite fighter jets, it's a real shame that Russia still allows them to be easily spotted in open areas with nothing more than some net in that's only half covering the jet. So it's just astonishing that Russia is still at this safety and protection level, or lack thereof, for some of its most key assets in this war. It boggles the mind. Then we'll head across to the Ukrainian map today, as in terms of the actual Shahed drones fired from Russia into Ukraine overnight, Ukrainian air defenses managed to shoot down all 20 of them. Air defenses also shot down a lone Russian KH-59 missile. Also, Russia reportedly fired off a single Iskander K cruise missile into Ukraine, which missed its goal. But whether that was because of a, an air-based interception or perhaps even just the failure of the Russian missile fizzling out, which we have seen before, is not clear yet. Then we'll head across more specifically into the Donbass today as over the weekend there was a massive explosion and resulting fire at an oil depot just southeast of uh, Donetsk city all in what has been a continuing campaign by the AFU to knock out logistics and logistics-related materials. Then, not too far from here, just today, Russians attempted a, another attack on the Avdivka front. So, about 15 Russian APVs with infantry drove through the Krasnorivka settlement to the Kokslag heap, aka the Terracon, and then they dropped off the infantry and proceeded to turn around. 
but thanks to the combined efforts of all the brigades on the site, more than half the equipment was destroyed. So tactics generally do not change for the Russian forces, as we see regular column attacks in the hope of a quick operation. So again, we're talking about seeing the important role of observing the front line from AFU drones and other UAVs, which effectively reduces to zero the possibility of any Russian blitzkrieg on an operational or tactical level. Then moving a bit further south, not exactly 100% map news, but we saw a before and after photo of a pro-occupation individual who decided to mark their car with a Z symbol bullseye. And we've seen a lot of examples of this type of outcome before. For that of the, the cars of the, the proud supporters that, uh, that sport the Z symbol, Although it's almost as if the memo is not getting out in the occupied regions that when you advertise your car in this way, you've just targeted your vehicle for termination. Then we'll head all the way across to Kherson as there's very fresh reports of Ukrainian forces hitting and destroying four Russian main battle tanks just southwest of Krinky. And all while at the same time repelling uh, that very same uh, larger assault near the settlement. Now for this particular one, there's no photos just yet, although it would, it would clearly seem like Russia's southern command here felt that uh, mustering up a few tanks would change the balance of power for this region, this settlement that they're attempting to take back. And yet, it simply cannot be understated that this location is one of the key areas where a very, very large assortment of very capable Ukrainian FPV and Baba Yaga drones exist in the skies at some truly staggeringly high numbers. Which has led to a situation where almost no Russian armoured vehicles come away unscathed. Then we'll move a little bit more to the west near to the liberated uh, city of Kherson itself on the north bank, as explosions were audible nearby to the city, reportedly to, uh, due to the use of the Russian deployed Shah head drones flying in the area, typically coming from the, uh, the Crimean Peninsula. Although, given what we know about uh, typical Russian drone flight paths, which tend to flood this oblast's airspace, it's perhaps not surprising that the AFU was sufficiently prepared to neutralize 100% of the drones into Ukraine, as was for today's outcome. Then we'll head across to some news for today. So starting off, uh, the AFU received a batch of the new AQ-400 Scythe attack UAVs. And these come from one of the local Ukrainian manufacturers that uh, goes by the name of Terminal Autonomy who stated that it had an initial uh, production capacity of 100 units, but plans to increase the number to 500 units into the near future. And really, these are just one of many long-range UAV drone platforms that Ukraine now has its hands on, and truly produced themselves. And do note that although these particular drones probably wouldn't win any beauty pageant contests, they do have a range of up to 750 kilometers, which is in fact almost exactly the distance between Kyiv and Moscow cities. Then in some other hardware related news for Ukraine, so these two Leopard 2A6s, these beauties just finished their repairs in Lithuania and returned back to Ukraine to continue the fight. Now, as for some context, in total, Ukraine had uh, been uh, had to deal with about 10 damaged Leopard 2s and about 5 or so destroyed or irreparably uh, yeah, destroyed Leopard 2 tanks there. Which means that uh, when not including the damaged and repaired tanks like these two, Ukraine impressively only ever lost about 10% of their Leopard 2 main battle tank fleet which certainly speaks to the platform's high survivability. Then in some other news, as announced by the Turkish Ministry of Defense, Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey will sign a plan in Istanbul on the, the, the 11th of January regarding the demining of sea mines in the Black Sea. 
And so by Russia performing this invasion of Ukraine and using the Black Sea for its own war or military objectives, it only serves to frustrate its potential former allies who it also shares the Black Sea with. And given the geography here, it's a perfect example of how Russia could never have had this war with Ukraine in isolation. So essentially, there's a lot of disgruntled neighbours that Russia never made any considerations for. Almost like a selfish, greedy child who ruins the game for everybody else. Then in some other news, uh, let's see, so protesters in Kyiv. But it's not a case of them protesting to be, to wanting to be annexed by Russia or something like that, as online trolls would probably want you to believe. In fact, quite the opposite, as they once again protest to demand higher portions of the Kyiv city budget expenditures uh, to instead go to the military. And so we've seen a few events like these before within Ukraine, and obviously not something that uh, the Kremlin would be fond of due to their narrative on how Ukrainians want to be Russians or, or something equally as nonsensical. Then moving across to a Russian military mobilization blunder segment of sorts. So in follow-up to Putin's recent end-of-year public forum conference from a couple of days ago, civilians were asked on the streets of Russia what types of questions that they really wanted Putin to address such as, when will the mobilized men be released? So really go back home. Another one was, why are Russian pensions so small? There was also quite a few questions on, when will the war be over? Even a couple of questions on, when will Putin <laughs> drop dead? And some didn't even ask questions. They just made the statement about not wanting to raise their children to be sent to war, only to be returned in a coffin. So there's a fair amount of perhaps surprising sentiment that shows many within Russia are increasingly not on board with Putin's self-created confusing war. Then moving across to a quick funny to round it all off for today, guys. So this one's uh, as for some of Russia's latest additions, hardware additions in the field, if you will. So we've come across this modified Buhanka Scooby-Doo van just a comedic monstrosity with cope cage that you can't really see, followed by adding on top um, a sheepdog inspired camouflage. So just when I think Russian Scooby-Doo van upgrades could not be any more embarrassing, this comes along. Oh, and clearly it's going to have a difficult time traveling at night, covering those headlights. Also, it, it's just better to, to paint the van white, like snow, as with the conditions that it finds itself in. That, that's how camo works. But no, as this one sticks out like a sore beige thumb instead. And I'm sure an aerodynamics engineer somewhere just had a flipping stroke when checking this one out. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, thanks again for watching. A little bit of a shorter video, but uh, yeah, thanks again. Uh, please continue to like, subscribe if not already, comment. I really always do appreciate that and all the support there. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.